Students, welcome to this, my latest installment in my continuing lecture series on a systematic review of chapters 2 and 3, and then later 4, 5, and so on and so forth, all the way through the end of the first semester of general chemistry. In this video, I'm going to teach you how to convert from grams to moles and vice versa to determine the amounts of reactants and products in a reaction, and then eventually we'll move towards determining limiting reactants and percent yields. Are you ready? Let's go ahead and get started. So to calculate the amount of products that will be formed from a given amount of reactant, you must do the following. First, balance the chemical equation, unless you've already done that. Second, always, and I put six exclamation points here, convert the amount of reactant that you've been given into moles, or if you prefer millimoles, unless it's already given to you in moles or millimoles. So I'm going to shake my hands around like a pirate and say, Always, 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 always convert to moles. Third, use the stoichiometric coefficients in the chemical equation to create a reactant to product ratio. And then fourth, multiply the amount of millimoles or moles from step two by the ratio that you have in step three to determine the amount of product made. Let's take a look then at a problem. When benzene reacts with bromine, bromobenzene is obtained according to this equation. So when 30 grams of benzene react with excess bromine, how many moles of bromobenzene are made? And how many grams? And then separately, when 20 grams of bromine react with excess benzene, how many moles of HBr are made? And how many grams? Now I'm not going to do this for you here, but you can click a link here to a separate video in which I show you how to do that on the dot cam. Now to another problem. Several brands of antacids use aluminum hydroxide to react with stomach acid, which contains primarily HCl, and in doing so undergoes this reaction. I want you first to balance this equation, then calculate the number of grams of HCl that can react with 0.5 grams of aluminum hydroxide. Afterwards, calculate the number of grams of aluminum chloride, this product right here, and the number of grams of water formed when 0.5 grams of aluminum hydroxide reacts. Once again, I'm not going to do this problem for you here, but you can click a link here to a separate video, which I'll show you how to do it on the dot cam. Here's another one. The complete combustion of octane, whose formula is given here, and that happens to be one of the major components of gasoline, proceeds according to this equation. How many moles of O2 are needed to burn 1.5 moles of octane? How many grams of O2 are needed to burn 10 grams of octane? And octane has this density. How many grams of O2 are required to burn 15 gallons of octane? Similarly, I'm not going to do this for you here, but we'll invite you to attempt it on your own. And then if you like, you can click the link here to a separate video in which I'll show you how to do it on the dot cam. That moves us to a new topic, that of theoretical yield. Now, the theoretical yield is the amount of product that you would calculatedly, and I'm not sure if that's actually a word, but anyway, the amount of product that you would calculatedly make from a given amount of reactant. In other words, if I run a reaction, I put in a certain amount of reactant, how much product am I expecting to get out? Now, to determine the theoretical yield, just follow the same steps that we've already been doing for the previous examples. First, balance the chemical equation, unless it's already balanced. Second, always, with six exclamation points, convert the amount of reactants from grams into moles, or millimoles if you prefer, unless it's already given to you in moles or millimoles. You can never, ever keep it in grams. You can't convert from grams of one thing to grams of another directly. Grams and grams do not touch each other. Only moles and moles. You always, always, always have to convert to moles. Hopefully I've made my point. Third, use the stoichiometric coefficients in the chemical equation to create a reactant to product ratio. And fourth, multiply the amount of millimoles or moles from step two by the ratio you created in step three. The amount of product calculated is its theoretical yield. Let's take a look then at a problem. When benzene, once again, reacts with bromine, it makes bromobenzene. When 30 grams of benzene react with excess bromine, what's the theoretical yield of bromobenzene? And when 20 grams of bromine react with excess benzene, what's the theoretical yield of HBr? I'm not going to do this for you here, but we'll post a link here to a separate video in which I show you how to do it on the dot cam. Hopefully now, with the command of the subject under your belt, let's move on to the next one, which is very, very related, and that is limiting reactants. The limiting reactant is the reactant that runs out first in a chemical reaction. The other reactant, the one that doesn't run out, is said to be added in excess. Now this can be a very daunting subject for students to understand at first, so please pay attention. To determine which reactant is the limiting reactant, you first of all have to balance the chemical equation, then always convert everything into moles, 
Then, based on the stoichiometric ratios for the reactants in your equation, determine which of your reactants is in excess and which one will run out first. And then last, remember that the one that runs out first is your limiting reactant. I think this is easy to understand if you look at an example that I call the bicycle example. I want you to pretend that you own a bicycle factory. Your factory makes bikes so simply that all you have to do is the following process to make a bike. You have one frame and two wheels, you slap them together, you have a bike. Now I realize that real bikes aren't actually that simple in real life, but I'm trying to make this very simple. You only have two parts that you have to put together, one frame and two wheels. You slap those together in your factory and you have a bike. They happen, of course, to exist or be put together in a one to two ratio. One frame for every two wheels. Hopefully you can kind of picture that in your mind. So I have a series of questions to ask you. If I have two frames and two wheels, which reactant, the frames or the wheels, will run out first? And if I do that, how many bikes will I end up making? I want you to think about this question and see if you can figure it out. In fact, you can pause the video here and then I'll go ahead and talk you through it in a moment. So here's the answer. As you can imagine, if you have two frames and two wheels, you're actually going to have more frames than you have wheels to go with those. Since every individual frame requires two wheels, you actually have to have four total wheels to go with two frames. So what that means is that one of those frames is going to be used combined with the two wheels to make one bicycle and the extra frame will just be an excess and left over. So that means once again that the thing that's going to run out first is the wheels because you don't have enough wheels for all the frames. So you have excess amount of frames. You also end up getting one bike out the other end. Hopefully you're okay with that. How about this question? What if you have four frames and four wheels? What if you have eight frames and 15 wheels? What if you have 10 frames and 22 wheels? Now, I'm not going to talk you Now I'm not going to talk you through these ones, but we'll invite you to think about them in your own mind. Make sure that you have your head wrapped around how to picture this, how to picture which thing runs up first and how to picture how many bikes get made out of the other end, okay? Because because you really need to have a solid lock on this before we go on. Are you ready then? Are you sure? Are you sure? Are you sure? All right, let's take a look at a little bit more abstract example. And I say abstract because it's difficult to picture in your mind individual molecules on the molecular level because you can't see them. But here is one. I want you to imagine this equation where I've got two moles of water reacting with one mole of O2 to form two moles of H2O. It's a very real reaction and it can totally be done. Now, although this seems much more abstract, it's exactly the same principle and logic as with the bicycle example. So I ask you the question, if I had two moles of H2, and one mole of O2, how many moles of H2O would I make? You can think about that. I've got two moles of this, one mole of that. How many moles of H2O do I get out? Yeah, obviously I'm going to get out two moles of H2O. Okay, because I just gave you the numbers that are the coefficients in front of the, these in the bounce stoichiometric equation. Okay, let's move on to a slightly tougher one. What if I had four moles of H2 and one mole of O2? Which reagent would run out first? I invite you to think about that, okay? I'm not going to answer it for you. Now, this example. If I had four moles of H2 and I had 12 moles of O2, which reagent would run out first? And how many moles of H2O, in this case, would I make? Now, hopefully you have a solid command of this and you can answer that question, because you need to be able to, to go on. So with this in our minds, we're now going to move on to the subject of percent yields. When we run reactions in real life, we almost always isolate less product than the calculated amount would predict. We lose product on glassware sometimes, we lose product somewhere, and sometimes the reactions don't go perfectly. So we accordingly report something called a percent yield to quickly communicate how efficient a given reaction is. How do you calculate percent yield? Well, to determine your percent yield, you first balance the chemical equation, unless it's already balanced, second, Always convert everything to moles or millimoles if you prefer, but don't leave it in grams or milliliters or any of that crap. It has to be moles or millimoles. Third, determine which reactant is your limiting reactant, as we just got done discussing. And fourth, calculate the amount of product, either in moles or millimoles, that would be formed from your limiting reactant based on your equation stoichiometry. This is called your theoretical yield. So this is the amount of product that you would form if everything went perfect. And then fifth, 
calculate your percent yield by using this equation. Your actual yield, and keep in mind your actual yield is the amount of product that you actually got when you ran the reaction, and usually that's told to you in the problem. You divide that by your theoretical yield, and remember your theoretical yield is the amount that you just calculated in the previous slide. It's the amount of product that you would get if everything went perfect. So you divide actual by theoretical and then times it by 100. Now this might seem a little abstract, so let's go ahead and take a look at a problem. Sulfur and oxygen reacts to produce sulfur trioxide according to the equation right here, which is not balanced. In a particular experiment, 7.9 grams of SO3 are produced by the reaction of 5 grams of O2 with 6 grams of sulfur. What is the percent yield of SO3 in this experiment? Now if you like, I invite you to attempt to do this on your own using the steps that I just outlined, or get at least as far along as you can. At that point, if you still have some confusion, you're welcome to click the link here to a separate video in which I'll show you how to do it on the board. Now having watched that video or gotten a command on your own on how to do this, I now invite you to do this next problem. Propane, that has this formula, reacts with oxygen in the air to produce carbon dioxide and water. Now I haven't written out the equation. You should be able to write out the formulas of the reactants and products just by that sentence description and then balance that chemical equation. Now in a particular experiment, 38 grams of carbon dioxide are produced by the reaction of 22.05 grams of propane with excess oxygen. What is the percent yield of this reaction? Now this is interesting because it already tells you that oxygen is the excess reagent, so you don't need to figure out what their limiting reactant is. Uh, it's propane. So I'm not going to do this problem for you, but invite you, based on what I've just shown you, to do it on your own. That takes us to the end of this lecture set. Please stay tuned to the next one, in which I'll continue doing a systematic review of chapters 4 and 5 from first semester Jan Chem. Until next time, my students, have an enjoyable rest of your day.